Kitsinger was staying just outside of Ocherius. And he asked Michael to come down and see him. And um, Michael talked to me about that. And I said, but I don't understand why you're Prime Minister. Why are you going down there to see him? And he said, because he asked me to come down and see him. I said, you're Prime Minister. He comes to see you at Jamaica House. And then Kissinger came in and saw him at Jamaica House. Welcome everybody to another episode of the Less You Forget podcast, a historical podcast by Tenement Yard Media. I'm Davey. I'll just be giving a brief introduction for this episode because it's a very unique episode and the first time we're doing this at Less You Forget podcast. So, um, this wasn't supposed to even be an episode. We never really planned for this. We're going to start the new year talking about like the history of pigs in the Caribbean. That was our first episode. Um, but Henry Kissinger died in the latter end of the, of the year, in 2023. And, you know, there are numerous articles that came out talking about his legacy in different parts of the world, um, in Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, Angola, Western Sahara, Chile. His legacy is tall. You get me what I'm trying to say? But his legacy doesn't exist in the Caribbean. You understand? And international media houses never made that. You get me? Right? Which, that shouldn't come as any surprise, because when it comes to global history, global politics, geopolitical relations, global solidarity, global oppression, global achievements, West Indians... Nine out of ten times, I just remind the world, say, yo, we're here and this event affects us, this person affects us. Like, we, this, we have a connection to this. You understand? We're not just sons on a beach. Like, but there, you understand? Like, most of us just remind people. You understand? And Tenement Yard Media being a Jamaica based collective made up of Jamaicans, we realized that not even Jamaica media houses were saying anything about Henry Kissinger legacy in the Caribbean, especially Jamaica. You understand? Because by one country, Never talk about Kissinger. It was Jamaica. You understand? Usually people talk about Cuba and Kissinger, but it's very much the Angola angle. So we expect, you know, Jamaica for sure. You know? They never do that. You understand? At best, people copy and paste AP, which, I mean, they have to do. But we still wanted people to know. You understand? But instead of writing an episode, it was just like, what we can do is Michael Malley have a first person narrative about Henry Kissinger and Jamaica already. So why not just, you know, use that, you understand? And what we're going to hear is Michael Money talking about what took place between Henry Kissinger and him and the implications that had for Jamaica, that he witnessed that happened to Jamaica. And this is taken from Jamaica Struggle in the Periphery. If you have the book, big up yourself. But for persons who don't have the book, this is basically like a very small audio version of <laughs> the audio version of what we're talking about. And we did take out a few paragraphs um, because it's a bit too long, you don't know. Money I gotta use him journalism degree, so if I just condense it a little bit. And yeah. There it, so this is just going to be the historical side. For a political side, um by the time you hear this or a few days later after after this job, we're gonna have the political side of the Henry Chris in Jamaica whole thing on our website and I need digs. Um, Dr. Hogley, who's the current director of the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute at UWE, published a book looking at foreign policies that Jamaica enacted between the, in the 70s and 80s, right? And he had, a, he had a summary of that in a academic paper. And we seek his permission and the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute to publish um, a portion of that paper on our website. So that's going to look at the political science view between everything that Michael Manu was talking about. But for this episode particularly, this is just the historical side point of view. And yeah, this is a first person narrative. So that is it. For persons who have no idea what Michael Manu is gonna talk about, the what we're seeing him talking about is nineteen seventy five. Well the event started in the event that Michael Mann is talking about started in nineteen seventy five. Angola gained independence from Portugal in November 1975. And MPLA, which was the most organized and the most popular group in the country that was leading the, that, that independence movement, um, they were going to be in power. And, but they were leftists. You get me what I'm trying to say? And this is like, you don't know, Cold War. You understand? But... Angola has a Angola situ Angola geopolitics is very important because remember Angola oil diamond plus them share a border with Congo you understand which is arguably the most mineral rich country especially now we're seeing 
how that is being played out. So what Guan what what Guangdong is seeing is that the US and Kissinger coming out of Vietnam, which was very unpopular, couldn't afford another war. So they basically just play proxy with South Africa and Angola. So what they did, you know, you know, connections make talk, make talk, make. And in two twos, by November 1975, you had South Africa, this is apartheid South Africa at the time, they started to invade Angola. Um, MPLA, seeing what's happening, can't them not have the, the facilities to be like, yo, you know, people are running up on them borders. Them not have... You know, all of them things you have to fight off them people. Plus, this is, a, this is a newly independent country. You get me? So, them ask the world for help. But they not listen. But then Cuba here and Cuba say, yo, no Mexico, we are sent. So, we are sent help. You understand? And Cuba goes to boom and send troops. So, that is basically what Michael Manley is talking about. So, we are going to hear what Michael Manley say, what happened after Cuba um, send help, you know, in Angola and how Jamaica end up in that whole thing. Cool? Nice? All right. Vibes. Taken from Jamaica, a struggle in the periphery by Michael Manley, pages 111 to 117. Fidel Castro and the Cuban leadership faced their single most difficult decision since the success of the revolution in 1959. It was by no means their first crisis, but involved a decision of epic proportions. They had to consider the enormous logistical problems since no Cuban plane could fly direct from Cuba to Angola. They had to face a military judgment of profound difficulty. Could they get combat troops to Angola quickly enough and in sufficient numbers to avoid a disastrous defeat for those who would arrive first? This would have had tremendous political implications for them at home and internationally. Would South Africa escalate the conflict if Cubans engaged them in combat? How would the expenses of a protracted war be met? Then there was the most difficult question of all. There were signs that at long last a thaw in the relations between Cuba and the United States might be coming. They had felt the pressure of economic blockade for 15 years. They had a high price for it. What would the U.S. do if they moved? In the end, the leadership met for an entire night and took their decision as the first light of dawn appeared to the east of Havana. They decided they must respond to Nito's cry for help. It was a decision that altered the course of history. Cuban transport planes took to the skies within hours. Many had their last refueling stop in Bridgetown, Barbados, on their way across the Atlantic. Others refueled in Guyana. They got there in time. When the first Cuban units assembled in Luanda and began moving south, the South African army was already 500 miles into Angola. They were not quick enough. They were engaged by Cuban forces at Benguela and Malinge on November 14, 1975. Their bluff called. The leaders in Pretoria thought again. They ordered the units back inside Namibia once the first defeat had established the quality of the Cuban force which they faced, the fledgling state was saved. In due course, the MPLA, a popular movement for the liberation of Angola, was able to stabilize the situation and Angola thus took its place as an honorable member of the heroic fraternity, the frontline states. It is this group which has borne the brunt of the struggle for freedom in Zimbabwe, the struggle that continues in Namibia and must one day be resolved in South Africa itself. It is impossible to overestimate the significance of this Cuban action. You have to go back to the days of Alexander the Great to find a parallel where so small a country, by feat of arms, has affected so profoundly the balance of forces on a continent. If South Africa had installed Jonas Savimbi as its puppet ruler, it is safe to say that Rhodesia's Ian Smith would be firmly in control to this day. By now, Zambia might have fallen. Namibia would be a lost cause. Botswana throttled. Tanzania and Mozambique impossibly isolated. Certainly Tanzania could have lifted the yoke of Idi Amin from the necks of the Ugandan people. The whole of southern Africa 
might now be firmly in the grip of the racists operating through puppet regimes which they could manipulate while isolating the others. This may seem like an exaggeration, but the progressive group of regimes involved face enormous problems. Danger lurks everywhere for the regimes which stand firmly against imperialism and for a different configuration of power in the world. They are threatened by internal sabotage and external pressure. The survival of each is affected by the solidarity of the group. The margins are as fine as the dangers are real. It is in this context that we must understand the survival of a progressive Angola in 1975. The Western economic system would have an uninterrupted vista of exploitation of those untapped resources which amount from Zaire due east and all the way south. None of this was lost on the multinational corporation. None of this escaped the attention of political leaders of northern industrial countries. Certainly, none of the implications were missed by Henry J. Kissinger. Moreover, apart from reading the deeper strategic implications, Kissinger was personally appalled by the whole turn of events. At home in a world dominated by US and Soviet power, a master of the game plan in which the big pieces dominate the chessboard of human history, Kissinger's sense of order was outraged at the thought of mere pawn behaving as if it were a queen or at least a rook or a knight. How dare a little foot soldier on the world's military stage transport troops thousands of miles as if it were a major power? The normal world of power politics cannot accommodate variables of this kind. If small nations can determine the fate of the weaker brethren, what world order is possible in this view? It is now history that Kissinger reacted with almost ungovernable rage to what had taken place. He was already discomfited by the exposure of the hand that the CIA had played in the entire matter. Now he was to take out his anger by mobilizing anybody in Latin America who would listen. My own experience with Kissinger in the matter was instructive. As all this was unfolding in Africa during 1975, Jamaica was feeling the economic pinch. Foreign exchange was scarce. One of my economic advisors had come up with a plan to ask the U.S. government to make available trade credits worth $100 million in 1976 to help keep our vital industries going. These were not to be gifts, but actual commercial credits to be paid for with interest over reasonable periods of time. At the very moment when this idea was being broached in Washington, the CIA was busy working for the downfall of NATO and the MPLA. Then, as luck would have it, Henry Kissinger was to spend a short vacation on Jamaica's north coast with his new bride, Nancy. The visit was in response to an invitation by our foreign minister and took place shortly after the South Africans returned to Namibia. I had invited him to lunch during his stay and he had accepted. During lunch, he sat on my right and although probably fuming at his interruption of his holiday, was very much his witty and urbane self. He assured us that the CIA was not interfering in Jamaica's affairs. The question arose because there was considerable speculation at the time that this was indeed the case. As he said it, similar assurances given concerning Chile flashed a little ominously across my mind. Suddenly he raised the question of Angola and said he would appreciate it if Jamaica would at least remain neutral on the subject of the Cuban army presence in Angola. I told him that I could make no promises, but would pay the utmost attention to his request. I pointed out that we were at the very moment dispatching Dudley Thompson to Africa to find out at first hand how the Africans viewed the situation in Angola. I said further that the South African invasion was a terrible thing as far as we were concerned, and that we would be paying close attention to the actual sequence of events as between the entry of South African and Cuban troops. In any event, I told him that before taking any official position on it internationally, I would communicate with him in Washington. Afterwards, Kissinger and I retired to my office for a short tete-a-tete. -tete. Again, as if from nowhere, he brought up a subject. This time it was a Jamaican proposal for the $100 million trade credit. He said they were looking at it, and let the comment hang in the room for a moment. I had the feeling he was sending a message. We took the Angolan situation so seriously that I spoke to Nair and Kaunda on the phone personally. 
canvassing their views on what had actually happened. Dudley Thompson attended the OAU meeting, which was called to discuss the Cuban presence and the role. The OAU voted to support Cuba's action, although many of its members were bitterly opposed to Cuba's revolutionary government and Marxist-Leninist process. We knew what Jamaica's duty must be. Within five days of his leaving for home, I let Kissinger know that Jamaica had decided to support the Cuban army presence in Angola because we were satisfied that they were there because of the South African invasion. The Jamaican government then publicly announced its support for Cuba and Angola. I never heard another word about the $100 million trade credit. Of course, I could never say positively that this was an example of the famous Kissinger theory of linkage. But the question has been left hanging in my mind. Soon after the news that Jamaica was supporting Cuba, Kissinger confidant James Reston of the New York Times wrote a vicious and utterly inaccurate article about Jamaica. The article marked a turning point in Jamaica's image in the United States. Reston's wild charges about violence in Jamaica, the alleged presence of Cuban troops and Cuban secret agents all added up to an impression of a Cuba takeover. This started off as a chain reaction in the US press which never ceased until they were finally defeated in the elections of October 1980. The launch was in December. Before the end of January, the US embassy staff in Kingston was increased. Seven new staffers were flown in, yet all aid to Jamaica suddenly slowed to a virtual halt. The pipelines suddenly became clogged. Economic cooperation contracted as the embassy expanded. And with that, we call an end to today's episode. To view the sources used in this episode and our recommendations to learn more about the topic, visit our website at tenementyardmedia.com. A transcript of this episode will be available five days after it has been posted to podcast outlets. And remember, this is a conversation we really want to hear from you. Follow our social media pages at tenementyard underscore on both Instagram and Twitter to view additional postings on this episode and updates on other content created by Tenement Yard Media. We're open to conversation about this and other episodes and really all happenings around Caribbean history and culture. Just a quick note before we leave, we're over on Patreon at patreon.com slash tenementyardmedia if you would like to support the show with a monthly donation of as little as $1. You can also make a donation of your choice at tenementyardmedia.com. Until next time, this has been Lest We Forget, a historical podcast from Tenement Yard Media.